All right, you want to hit the intro? Great. Okay, welcome back, everyone. This is Sam Biagetti of Historian Splaining. And this will be the second part of our grand survey of Western architecture. And this is part two from the High Middle Ages to the Renaissance. And if you watched the first part, uh, you may know that we left off basically talking about the Carolingian period and the sort of flowering of a very rich, eclectic style of Western architecture under the rule of Charlemagne and his immediate successors in the Carolingian Empire. And that was followed then by a period of relative fragmentation, disorder, poverty. The Carolingian Empire broke apart into pieces. Europe was subjected to decades of Viking raids that rained down destruction on much of the continent. So there was a period of relative quiescence with very little new building and practically no building in stone. But eventually, with the return to some degree of order, stability, prosperity in the late 900s, there then was a, a new flowering, a reawakening of monumental architecture. And so I'm going to hopefully cover from that point all the way through to the beginnings of the Renaissance in the 1400s. So we're talking about almost 500 years here of architecture, which is a lot less right, in terms of chronology than we talked about in the first part, where we went right from ancient Egypt on up through the Romans, the Byzantines, and into the Middle Ages. But this is going to be a more detailed lecture with a lot more images. It might go on a bit longer. Hopefully, if there's enough time, we'll get all the way to the Renaissance. We'll see. But this is going to be more detailed with more images because this is an era of from which there are much more surviving buildings, for one thing, right? There are a lot more medieval and Renaissance buildings still lying around all over Europe than there are ancient Greek or Roman buildings. And also the buildings, as you'll see, often were very rich and complex, and there's a great deal of significant detail in them. And so this is there's a lot of visual to look at. There's a lot that's very beautiful and intricate. Hopefully you'll enjoy seeing them, but it might take a little longer to get through. And lastly, the last reason is that this is basically my favorite period <laughs> of architecture. So there's a lot that I really want to say and point out. So if we can just look at the slides. So it happens this introductory slide is just an image of the Great Hall of Hampton Court Palace in London. And it is also a very complex eclectic building with a combination of medieval forms with Renaissance decorative themes. So it encapsulates a lot of the things we're going to talk about. But in order to understand it, we have to look through the, the, the meaning of these different styles of architecture and how they came about. So if you watched the first lecture, you might remember, I started off by pointing out some basic themes or axes of variation that we use, that I like to use to describe different styles of architecture. And I won't go through them completely again, but just to quickly recap, there's a verticalism versus horizontalism. Right? Do the lines, the direction of your building point upward towards the sky? Do they take off from the landscape or are they horizontal? Do they reach out to embrace the landscape? Linearity versus centrality. Is your building laid out in such a way as to draw the visitor in and forward from front to back? along a, a single linear axis, or is it centrally organized, looking inward towards a central focal point? And lastly, plainness and simplicity versus richness and ornamentation. And what I'm going to argue in this lecture is basically that when we look through the different eras of architecture, especially over about the past thousand years, you can see a repeating cycle of evolution 
that I liken to a seasonal cycle of the year. So what has happened in at least, I would say at least two distinct cycles is that a new style is conceived that meets the desires, the needs of a certain moment. And over time, that style tends to gain greater richness, complexity, it's embellished, and you get a new style that is more dramatic, more ornate, and more verticalist. And then that can further evolve into what I would call an, an autumn style, which is extremely rich, uh, extremely intricate, and which then eventually reaches a sort of limit, right? And there's a reaction in taste back to simplicity, balance, and I would call that a winter, right? So what I'm going to try to describe in this lecture, if we get through all of it tonight, is basically this cycle as it unfolded in the high and late Middle Ages. From a spring period of the Romanesque, which is defined by strong, sturdy exteriors, but intimate interiors. Then a stylistic summer in the high Gothic, which is the most dramatically vertical style, and that is rich in ornamentation. Then the late Gothic, which is characterized by complexity, intricacy, profusion of detail. And then a response to the late Gothic, which is the early Renaissance and its return to simplicity, balance, and understatement. So naturally, we'll start with the Romanesque, but first I will just check if there are um, there are comments. Okay, great. So I'll start with the first part, naturally enough, on the Romanesque, which was the first style of the High Middle Ages. And just as one example here, this is part of the Romanesque nave of Gloucester Cathedral in England, built in the early 1100s. So as I said, there was a period of relative fragmentation, disorder, poverty through most of the eight and nine hundreds. But finally, that started to change, really beginning in the 960s and starting in Central Europe, especially in Germany. And one of the very important developments that happened is that the German king, Otto, was able to consolidate power and expand German territory around much of Central Europe and also gain the throne of Italy, of what was left of the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy. And he added that onto his domains and formed what he called the Holy Roman Empire. And in 962, he was formally crowned as Holy Roman Emperor. So he was the first so-called emperor in Europe since the, the fall of the Carolingian Empire. And this allowed for some degree of greater stability, a return to more long-term travel and trade. And naturally, one of the things that Otto wanted to glorify his reign in this new empire was monumental building. And so very soon after his coronation in 962, you start to see grand new churches and monasteries built, basically on the Carolingian plan, looking pretty similar to what we already saw last time from the Carolingian age. So this is an example here, Sanct Pantaleon in Cologne. This is a side view. You can see it's grand, impressive, uh, but it's rather blockish, right? The different parts are basically just rectilinear, sort of stuck together. And then here we see the interior, which looks like more or less a conventional basilica form, right? A large nave with a high ceiling. In this case, it's still a wood coffered ceiling some windows in the clear story level, and then these side aisles offset by pillars. So this would have been a very familiar kind of church form people would have seen for hundreds of years. And you can see also it's even in the interior, it's pretty plain, unornamented. There are these big, almost completely bare white walls, just a few windows. Uh, the pillars are big and blockish. And so while it is grand and impressive, it can look rather uh, too plain. It can look rather uh, uninteresting, even a little forbidding, right? You can see from the side, it looks like it could be like a, a military fortress or warehouse. So there were various problems and shortcomings with this Carolingian style that people really wanted to address and to somehow solve. So for one thing, there were practical problems. 
the need for more apses, altars, and chapels because worship was changing, right? Worship in the early Romanesque era around 1000 was different from what people had known three or 400 years earlier. There was a much greater and growing cult of the saints, the desire to make pilgrimages, to pray to saints, to see images or relics, holy relics of saints. And as people were going on these longer journeys and pilgrimages, people wanted to hear mass whenever they got to a church or an abbey. And so it became customary for priests to say masses several times throughout the day or to have several priests assigned to a church to say many masses. So churches were centers of greater activity. And just having one single apse, like you see here in this church in Spain from the 1000s, just having one apse with one altar was no longer enough, right? Churches had to become complexes of many subdivided holy spaces for worship. They also just wanted more windows for more light and air, right? So here's a view of the same church, San Vincente de Cardona. And you can see it looks fortress-like. It has very few windows. It could be quite dark inside. You know, this photo is misleading, as so many photographs are, because there are artificial lights added in. This would have been a very dim space. And then also aesthetically, people wanted to, there was, there was a tension, and people wanted to square the circle. On the one hand, they wanted great height and majesty. They wanted these buildings to be appropriate to glorify God or the saints or the king or the emperor. But at the same time, they didn't want them to just look monolithic and imposing. They wanted the the buildings, especially inside, to be more intimate, more welcoming, to have private spaces for prayer and reflection. So there were all these tensions and contradictions in what people wanted out of a medieval building. And the Romanesque style basically formed out of a series of attempts to solve these problems. So here's one early response, a German, a distinctively German response, which was to create a church more or less on the Carolingian model, right? If we look at this one end of St. Michael's at Hildesheim, it looks similar to what we saw at Sanct Pantaleon, right? Like a Carolingian church. But the catch is that it's now mirror imaged. There are two chancels on either end of the church. You enter in the sides over here, and you can look in either direction. And there could be different things going on. Maybe in this apse here, a priest might be saying mass. Maybe down here, there's a choir performing a, a chant, right? And there are these little side galleries in the transepts. There are extra apses on the side. So it's becoming more like almost a little city, a little church complex, rather than just a simple linear church with one apse at the end. Another re Other responses were also experimented with in France. So this style, it seems first emerged possibly in Germany. Some people argue that St. Michael's Hildesheim is the first Romanesque church. But either way, it spread very quickly all throughout the Holy Roman Empire, all the way down into Italy, and also westward into France and Spain. And French builders tried out different solutions too. Like you see here at the Abbey Church at Cluny, they've worked in a bunch of apses and side chapels all around. There's one big main apse here where perhaps the abbot might perform mass, but then there are all these little side chambers and nooks and crannies. And then another somewhat simpler solution, but one that became very popular, is this one that you see here at Saint-Étienne de Vignory, where you have a basic basilica, like we've seen many times before, with the nave and the side aisles. But then instead of simply ending, the side aisles continue all the way around behind the chancel. So now the chancel, instead of just a wall in the back, there's a colonnade with pillars and columns. And behind it, you have this extra space called the ambulatory. And then more chancels with little chapels are added in, radiating out along the ambulatory. And that's what you see here in the photo of Saint Etienne. You see the, the, the back of the church, right? The east end with the, the big ambulatory and then these radiating side chapels. So all of these were ways to articulate and subdivide the space so different things could be going on and so that you could also create a feeling of, of intimacy even within this huge monumental stone church. And this is just an image of what I think of as a typical Romanesque interior space in maybe my favorite Romanesque building, which is St. Bartholomew the Great in London. 
And this is a, a so-called Norman style Romanesque church because the English associated this style with the Normans. But basically what you see here on the left, this is the main chancel with the altar, right? So normally mass would go on here, but then there's this side aisle, which just rather than ending, it continues, it curves around into the ambulatory. And then there are a little more private, often quiet sort of semi secluded side chapels. Like we see right here, this is a lady chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary. So you might go here to make prayers and to venerate St. Mary. So you, and you can see there's a sense of of privacy of semi-separated spaces even within this monumental stone structure. And then as for the aesthetic issue, Romanesque buildings did depend on enormous thick sturdy vertical stone walls which allowed you to build a large capacious building but they could look quite imposing like we saw. So they, the builders developed various methods to break up these massive vertical masses and to make them look more approachable, to have a sort of finer human scale texture. So here's an example here. This is a typical elevation or side wall along a Romanesque nave. And there's the little arcade here, right, that sets off the side aisle and then above that a gallery with another little arcade. And then finally, the clear story on top. And you can see on each level, the details become lighter, more delicate, almost as if the building is gradually lifting off into the air. And then this is a facade of a Romanesque church, Notre Dame la Grande in Poitiers in France. And what's interesting here is you can see basically the same technique repeated again, right? We have this big, heavy, sturdy looking arcade at the base around over the entranceway, then vertical bands with little sculpted figures, and then a little blind, a so-called blind arcade, meaning an arcade that doesn't actually go through to anything. It's purely decorative as basically mimicking the elevated gallery, right? And then another one on top of that, mimicking the clear story. So that sort of sense of, of tears delicately stacked, rising one on top of the other is then repeated in the exterior facade, like it looks inside the church. And then of course, as I said, there's the question of just how do you get more windows in to allow in more light and air? And the basic Romanesque method of doing that was simply taking a wall, whether it's flat or curved, and adding in buttresses, in heavy engaged buttresses. This is a very typical Romanesque building here, the Abbey of Lesse in Normandy. And you can see that here, these vertical buttresses, which then strengthen and stabilize the wall so that then you can, in between, you can break through and add in windows. So this is the typical look of a Romanesque building. And then this is an example over here from Germany. And you can see what they've done here is, again, a typical Romanesque motif that repeats over and over again. You put in buttresses, and then in between, you put in a double arched window bay. So rather than just having a big arch that looks sort of heavy, blockish, functional, instead you add in a slender column in the middle, dividing it in two, making it look lighter, more delicate, more intimate. And that becomes really the hallmark of Romanesque building of all kinds, and it spreads out into all forms and media. So these are examples of Romanesque houses in towns in Italy and Croatia. And you can see they're, they're sturdy, they're blockish, they're tall, just like a typical Romanesque building. But they've broken in little window bays, including these little double window bays with the slender columns, that typical motif. And then again, here you see a tall, narrow house in Croatia, same motif here with the double window bay. And then also this is uh, a, a preserved example of a wooden, a cantilevered wooden porch, which you would have seen on many Romanesque houses all around Europe. Same thing in castles. This is one of the reasons why people often look at Romanesque churches and say they look fortress-like or castle-like is because the same techniques then were carried over into castles. And this is a typical Normanesque castle, the White Tower of the Tower of London, built by William the Conqueror in the 1080s. And you see here these engaged buttresses running all the way up the height of the building, and then this blind arcade sort of dividing the facade, and then these little uh, double window bays 
set in towards the top. And again, the same technique of putting in the sort of heavier, sturdier elements at the bottom and then the lighter, more delicate details towards the top. And these same sort of techniques then were repeated in arguably the, the masterpiece of Romanesque castle building, which is Dover Castle, built by Henry II in the late 1100s. And Dover Castle is a really interesting example of architecture that is both decorative and functional. It is an actual real fortress that was built to overlook and protect the harbor of Dover, which is a major point where foreign enemies would have landed if they tried to invade England. But at the same time, it was built to look elegant, refined, palace-like, a palace, a castle fit for a king, and to make an impressive visual image as a diplomat or a foreign general or a merchant approached the harbor of Dover. So Romanesque really permeated all kinds of buildings. And here is one very rare surviving example, the Great Hall of Oakham Castle in central England, which also was built in the 1180s. And there probably were many great halls like this at that time all around England, but this is a rare example that survives. And you can see, again, it's built to look tall, sturdy, steep pitched roof, big heavy buttresses strengthening it, but then it is lightened with these decorative double window bays. And if you look inside, it's almost like a basilica, right? But but more open, uh, wider, and uh, like a meeting hall. You would have had a central hearth and then uh, a board or a table where the Lord might have sat and received guests or received his servants, his tenants, and uh, just a wood frame, simple wood frame roof which is what most buildings at this time still would have had. And it happens that there's this massive collection of horseshoes because the family of Oakham Castle was named De Ferrers, which can, it's sort of a double entendre. It sounds like Ferrier, the uh, horseshoe maker. So they had a custom that whenever a, a high status guest came to the Great Hall, they had to give a gift of a horseshoe. And we're just fortunate that this Great Hall and its particular uh, horseshoe collection happens to survive. And this is a one very rare example of a Romanesque civic building, right? Not built under the sponsorship of a king or an emperor or the church, but for a city republic, Mantova in Italy. And it's late Romanesque. So you can see it has this long, uh, you know, gentle, symmetrical arcade with the typical Romanesque half circle arches. And then over it, there is this row of window bays, which look again like fairly typical Romanesque window bays, except that now they're triple instead of double. So it's getting a little more embellished, a little more complex as you get into the late Romanesque era. But of course, the vast majority of surviving Romanesque buildings are ecclesiastical, built for worship and especially for pilgrimages. Romanesque sort of became the accepted style of pilgrimage churches. And this is a very important example uh, the Abbey Church of saint Foy in France, because it is one of the earliest surviving Romanesque stone vault buildings. So these earlier Romanesque buildings we've been looking at almost all still had wooden roofs, which could do the trick, but, you know, aesthetically, they didn't look as unified. They contrasted with the stone walls. They also had to be repaired and replaced. So it was around the mid-1000s that builders rediscovered the techniques of building stone vaults, so stone tunnel or uh, barrel vaults. And this was a very important early example. And you can see it allows for a much grander, more soaring building, and it creates a feeling of more unity. You can see the sheer vertical lines going up the walls and then continuing right over the vault and back down. And this was would have also been very good for acoustics, right? The sounds of chant, the sounds of prayer would echo in a grand vaulted building like this. And then all of these techniques, the arcades, the elevated galleries, the buttresses, the stone vaults, all of these techniques then were mobilized in the late 1000s with the sort of ultimate flowering of Romanesque building, which is seen most of all in two pilgrimage churches that were built around the same time on almost the same plan. And the first one by a very, by a hair was this one, Saint-Cernin de Toulouse in Toulouse, France, 
which was a pilgrimage site because it was on the route for pilgrimage on foot down through France into Spain to go to Santiago de Compostela with the tomb of St. James. And so very shortly after, the builders in Spain built a grand cathedral at Santiago on the same basic model as San Sernin de Toulouse, uh, just slightly bigger. But what San Sernin had that, that, uh, that Santiago did not is you can see here in the center at the crossing, they put in four huge, very sturdy piers, which could hold up the weight of a tower. And this was very useful for a pilgrimage church because it made the church visible for miles around for pilgrims approaching who might be coming from all directions. So this is really the first monumental Romanesque masterpiece, San Hernán de Toulouse. And you can see it's dramatically tall, vertical, imposing. And yet they've worked in all of these elements to sort of break up the tremendous facade and to make it look less imposing, more approachable. They've worked in these subtle horizontal bands in the masonry, uh, these gentle half circle arches, these gentle curves of the apse and transepts and the side chapels. And even in the enormous tower, they've broken it into these little tiers, each with its little arcade, growing thinner and lighter as you go to make the whole thing look uh, lighter, less towering really, even though it is a tower. So this is a sort of careful balancing act of verticalism and horizontalism. And this is the interior with the grand sweeping stone tunnel vault and the heavy side pillars, which nonetheless they've made to look a little lighter by adding in these sort of false engaged circular pillars along the sides. And these, again, these subtle horizontal bands. And then this is just a scene from the interior of Santiago de Compostela with the same basic idea, right? On the same basic plan. But in this case, they've just added in little classical Roman style uh, pillar capitals to give it a little, again, a little look of delicacy and lightness rather than just being completely heavy and imposing. So the Romanesque really started in sort of central West Europe, arguably first in Germany, and then very quickly developed and advanced in France and Spain. As it branched out from there, it took on different forms and variations in different countries, kind of distinct regional flavors. And possibly the most unique and distinctive is the Italian Romanesque. And this is the most dramatic example here, the, uh, the Basilica of San Miniato in Florence. And the basic shape you can see is just a typical basilica, just like you would have seen in an early Christian building. But they've added on this decorative facade, again, to sort of break it up, to make it look lighter. They've put in these engaged slender pillars, this gentle half circular arcade. And obviously, the Italian Romanesque is the most reminiscent of actual Roman buildings, right? One of the secrets about Romanesque is that it's not really all that Romanesque. But the, the exception is in Italy, where they had Italian villas and temples and bathhouses still sitting around. And they borrowed that sort of decorative pattern. In, and in this case, they've recreated it in a subtle inlay of different colored stones, like this green, this deep green is called serpentino marble. This is another variation on Italian Romanesque from a little later, the Cathedral of Pisa, which again, it's a massive, imposing building, but with these gentle, uh, engaged pillars and arcades. And then this very unusual blind arcade on the front facade, which stands just a few feet out from the actual building and looks almost like grill work or lattice work, adding sort of depth and lightness to the facade. And then that motif is repeated on the bell tower, the Campanile, uh, here off to the side, which is, of course, world famous today, mainly because it leans. Uh, but nonetheless, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a great example of Italian Romanesque architecture. It also made its way gradually into Eastern Europe. You can see fairly straightforward examples here. Uh, the Cathedral Church of Tum in Poland is basically on the German plan, right? The entranceway is not at the, the front end here as we would think of it, but in the side. And you have chancels and chapels on either end and these flanking uh, square-based 
towers. Same basic idea here at the Abbey Church of St. George in Hungary, but with a little more ornamentation worked in, right? So it makes its way eastward. And then interestingly, you may know I recently posted a lecture about Serbia, made me very interested in the architecture of Serbia. And this is an early instance of a Serbian Orthodox monastery from the 1100s, Studenica, which is an interesting example of hybrid of the Byzantine style, where you would have a simple Greek cross and then a dome over the crossing with Romanesque details, like you see these double bay, these double window bays. And uh, this is this is one of the ways that that Western and Byzantine could could cross fertilize. And here it's happening in Eastern Europe, in Serbia, which had a lot of close dealings and interactions with Constantinople. But there's also a distinct regional style in the West that did something similar, which is the Romanesque style of Aquitaine in southwestern France. And this is saint Fran in Perigueux from about the same time. And you can see this is um, almost like a normal Romanesque church if you ignore the roof and this sort of forest of domes and cupolas all over it, which clearly also is borrowing from the Byzantine style, which by this point, people in Southwest France would have encountered through travels to Constantinople and to the Holy Land during the Crusades. So you're getting more and more of these Eastern ideas from the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world coming into Europe, partly because of the Crusades. And this is just a look uh, from above at saint Fran, with these. You can see here more clearly the five domes, one over the crossing and then four others on each of the four arms of the church. So again, very much like a Byzantine form, but with Romanesque details. And then in Germany, there, there was all kinds of evolution of the German Romanesque. And over time, they built more and more massive monumental Romanesque cathedrals but they kept the same basic plan and layout. So here you see the biggest Romanesque building in the world, which is the Cathedral of Speyer. And it is tremendously tall, these four huge belfry towers, uh, a dome over one of the transept crossings. But the layout, again, is double-ended, symmetrical, just like St. Michael's at Hildesheim. And this is what it looks like inside. You have this huge soaring, towering nave with these transverse arches stabilizing it. And then if you look at the elevation to the side, you can see what they're doing is they have these main heavier pillars which support the transverse arches. And then in between, they have these lighter pillars that divide into two archways. So you get your double, again, your double window bay. And in order to push those windows as far up as possible to extend them all the way up, they've broken into the sides of the vault. So it's now no longer a simple tunnel vault. It has what's called groin vaulting, where you have these side arches intersecting with the transverse arches, creating these separate bays. And that's one way to get your more window space and get it up higher. And in England, these same basic techniques then were, were more or less copied. And a lot of English Norman Romanesque churches look pretty standard, like similar to what you'd see all around Europe. But a very important innovation that the English experimented with was ribbing. And this kind of changed the game because now you could, instead of just having a tunnel or a barrel, you could actually break up the weight and pressure of the vault and concentrate it on specific lines and then channel it down to the pillars. So this allowed you to shape the vault and almost sculpt it into all kinds of forms if you understood the geometry by which the ribbing would hold up the weight and stabilize it. And it creates such an effect that there are many places where uh, bombs or you know, falling uh, construction equipment have broken through panels of a Romanesque vault or a Gothic vault for that matter and completely wrecked it, but it remained intact because the ribbing stayed in place, 
right? So the two, each one, the ribbing and the, the masonry panels support each other, and one can actually stand up and stabilize even without the other. And this technique of ribbing and all these other techniques I've been talking about were all then mobilized to build the really the, the biggest and most impressive Romanesque masterpiece of England, which is Durham Cathedral. So you can see here they've managed to create, again, a, a vault, these two flanking square based towers flanking the east, the west entranceway, and then a massive tower on the crossing as well. And in order to be able to do that, they had to really finely design, plan, and stabilize the whole structure. And this is what it looks like inside. You have this groin vaulting, right, allowing for uh, a higher row of windows, even above the clear story. You have these sturdy pillars, but they have sort of lightened them by adding in subtle ornamentation in different patterns. That becomes typical of English and French, later Romanesque. And they've sort of broken the big pillars into little slender pieces with these sculpted engaged columns. And then this is the crossing, right? You have these, these huge sort of bunder, bundled columns, as they call them, even though really they're, it's all just one structure. It's just one big pier. So you have these four piers, and then above it, you can look up into the tower. And that lets in light and a feeling of greater openness and airiness. So the last element that I'll talk about in Romanesque that really uh, makes completes the effect and makes it possible for Romanesque building to feel intimate, approachable, welcoming, even as it is so heavy and monolithic, is small scale ornamentation, often small figures and forms just about at eye level, which can then engage the eye of the visitor and interact with or even distract from the massiveness of the structure around them. So there's a balancing of large and small. And the real laboratory where people developed these techniques of ornamentation was monastic cloisters. So this is an early Romanesque cloister of Santo Domingo de Silos in Spain, which sort of became the prototype where you have this uh, galleried square cloister with uh, apartments, cells, chapels around it, and then enclosing a square garden called a paradise garden within. And then you have this colonnade supporting the gallery and these sculpted capitals. And they, they had a sort of profusion of different figures and forms that the artists could experiment with, and they're often very creative. So here's slightly later Romanesque cloisters. This is at San Giovanni in Laterano in Rome, and you can see they're experimenting with intertwined pillar forms, spiral forms. And this is Moissac in France, where again, you have these sculpted capitals. And then at the corner pillars, they also have relief sculptures of saints or biblical scenes. And these are some examples of how this practice, this whole art form of Romanesque capitals could then carry over from the cloisters into churches, palaces. So these are two examples from the Abbey Church of Saint-Foy, which we saw earlier. And this one, it seems like maybe warriors with, with shields and helmets. And then this one, it looks like maybe this represents a fortress and possibly these are like defenders peeking over the edge of the fortress. A lot of these figures are really mysterious. We don't know why they were sculpted or what they might represent. Perhaps they were sort of, they served a function of uh, encoding stories, events in a story that you could tell as you brought a pilgrim visitor into the church. These are some more examples I gathered. Uh, two guys who seem to be maybe fighting, pulling each other's beards. And then on the corners are these sort of bearded, grotesque monster figures. This is another human scene. This might be someone playing music, a musical instrument. This seems to be maybe someone doing naked acrobatics. And then these two figures maybe having sex, maybe wrestling, hard to say, right? There's a lot of whimsy and fantasy here. And a lot of it, we just, we just don't know what to make of them. But they were clearly an important part of the embellishment of a Romanesque building. Here are a couple with uh, sort of monster winged figures. These are sort of sphinx-like figures or maybe uh, siren figures with human heads. 
And then lastly, these are sort of dragon figures, which you see often. And here they seem to be issuing out of the mouth of a human mask. And then I love this one. This is my favorite. You see these two dragon figures. And then if you look at the corner, their heads meet up into one and they seem to be eating a human. Does it represent something? Does it have some theological or folkloric meaning? Is it just for fun? We really don't know. But again, it creates this something very engaging and human in the Romanesque building. And then sort of the piece de resistance is, um, is tympanum relief sculptures, which would be in the archway over a doorway. And this again is at the Abbey Church of Saint-Foy. And we see here in the center, right over the middle of the door is a seated Christ judging the good and the evil. And he has his right hand lifted up to these folks who are you know, saints, monks, maybe patrons who help pay for the church, St. Peter with his keys. And then he has his left hand uh, pointing downward towards the evil who are damned and are being sort of uh, arrested by demons and various evil creatures and then fed into the mouth of some monster into hell where you have presumably the devil. So again, there's a lot of whimsy, a lot of fantasy, creativity, and it tells a story. And then lastly, there are some surviving Romanesque fresco paintings, not very many, uh, and there are some points where it cle it's clear that there were some, but they faded away or they were destroyed at some point. But a really dramatic surviving example is the frescoes in the crypt of the Abbey of San Isidoro in Spain from the early 1100s, which are very vibrant and rich and have scenes of, of Christ and the Gospels and saints, as well as just geometric decorative patterns, scroll work patterns, clearly inspired a lot by Roman frescoes. And this was important here because the Crypt of San Isidoro was the burial place of the tombs of the kings of Asturias in northern Spain. So you wanted it to be somehow impressive and engaging, despite the fact that basically it's just a basement. And again, this would have been very dim, right? This is the lower level of the building. There would have only been some candlelight. It would have been quite intimate. Uh, and frankly, hard to appreciate, right, the richness and the vibrancy of these frescoes. And that's part of why eventually builders moved beyond the Romanesque style and mustered new techniques of building taller and lighter with more windows to make a, a more impressive, more airy, and more lit building. But before I go on to that, I'll take a look at if there are uh, comments. Okay, I've seen all these architectural elements before, but I haven't paused to consider and understand them. That looks like the Alhambra. Was there Romanesque in the Muslim world or, or a cloister? Um, there, well, there was, there was Arabian and Middle Eastern influence in Romanesque, but not nearly as much as in the next era, which we're going to talk about next, which is the Gothic. Okay, let me see. Okay, part two, summer. Oh, let me see. The time, okay. So this is a view looking up into the vault of the choir of the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, which is in France, just outside Paris. And this is the birthplace of Gothic, right? The Gothic style has a more distinct, uh, specific time and place where it was conceived. And if it had a single inventor, it's at least it's, uh, its sort of intellectual father was the abbot of Saint-Denis, Abbot Suget, who not only was the abbot of this very old, rich, prestigious monastery, but also was a minister, more or less an unofficial prime minister to the king of France. And there was a traditional relationship between Saint-Denis and the French crown. And Saint-Denis actually, again, was the burial place of French kings of the Capet dynasty, like San Isidoro in Spain. So, so Abbot Suget wanted to glorify the French crown to show the close relationship and alliance between the French church 
and the monarchy, and to do so by basically breaking the bounds of Romanesque buildings and showing something more brilliant, more bright, more enthralling than the sort of enclosed intimate spaces of Romanesque building. And you can see he, with his, the builders of the building, they were able to bring about something very striking and new. So the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, at least the choir, as it was built in 1144 to 45, brought together certain distinct elements that had already been tried out before in Romanesque. They were not totally new, but they had never been put together before, and they had never been pushed to such an extreme degree. This was really a daring enterprise testing the limits and the boundaries of what stone could do. So one of these is pointed arches. So people often say, well, the difference between Romanesque and Gothic is the Romanesque has half circle arches and the Gothic has pointed arches. And that's not quite true. There are Romanesque buildings with pointed arches, but in the Gothic, they're used to a much more extreme degree. And they're used both for decorative purposes to make the whole look of the building more vertical right? And to, to draw and uh, almost push the eye upward towards heaven. And also structurally, a pointed arch can bear more weight without buckling as long as it is narrow, right? It, it may not be able to open up as wide and broad a space as a rounded half circle arch, but as long as it's narrow enough, it can reach higher and bear more weight. So if you're trying to build a vault or a tower as high as you possibly can, you're likely to base it on pointed arches. Another is ribbing. We saw ribbing like in the English cathedrals at Gloucester and Durham, but it's used much more extensively in the Gothic. And it not only is used to reinforce the vault, but to give it a sort of sculptural shape, a look of, of undulation, right? And you'll see how, how that happens in, in grand Roman, uh, Gothic vaults. The third one is flying buttresses. Uh, but before I talk about flying buttresses, I'll point out this is another view of the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis. And you can see these elements of the pointed arches, one pointing up towards the next, towards the next, right? Basically leading the eye up to the ceiling. The ribbing that then sort of springs out almost like branches out of a tree right out of the, the, the pillars, out into the groin vaulting of the vault. And down here, you see this is one of the effigy tombs of one of the French kings, right? So this is an appropriately soaring, bright, enthralling building to house the memorials of the kings of France. And then lastly, as I said, flying buttresses, which stand outside the nave or the aisles of the church, and serve to stabilize the whole structure so that you can build taller, but without blocking the light out of the windows. So these are some early examples of flying buttresses on Gothic buildings. They could sit on the ground and stabilize directly from the ground, or they could stand upon the walls of the side aisles and then lean into and so buttress and stabilize the nave. And this is most frequent in, in Gothic buildings. So you can see here, this is a diagram, right? So you, you can have an extremely tall nave. The vault might be reasonably stable, but the pressure of the weight of the vault pushes down. And because it is arched at the bases, it pushes outward, right? This is the problem with vaults and domes of all kinds is that they might be somewhat stable, but they push outward at the base and something has to be there to absorb that outward pressure so it doesn't collapse outward. And so in a Gothic building, you put in these flying buttresses, which then absorb that weight, channel it down to the ground. And here you can see in, in later Gothic buildings, they become decorative, right? They become thin, sculpted. And the idea is that if you reduce them into this sort of light, thin tracery form, you're letting in as much light as possible to shine right through into those windows, right? The whole goal is to bring as much sunlight as possible in to illuminate the interior of the building. So this is an example of what could be done in a Gothic vault uh, fairly quickly after the completion of Saint-Denis. So that was the initial sort of announcement of the new style. 
And then it spread around France first very quickly within just a few years. Uh, abbots, bishops, uh, city incorporations, dukes started putting money into building grand new buildings in this new style. And they didn't call it Gothic. They just called it the new style. And when it spread abroad beyond France, they simply called it the French style, right? Gothic is actually originally a term of abuse that Renaissance designers applied to this style, saying it was sort of barbaric, uh, superstitious, uh, undignified. But at this time, it was simply called the French style. And you can see uh, this is an example at Rouen. You can see the soaring vertical pillars, right, that with these uh, sculpted bands, that then run uninterrupted all the way up past the gallery, past this little row called the Triforium, past the clear story, all the way right up springing into the vault so that there is nothing uh, breaking this vertical sweep, right? A Romanesque builder might have said, this looks too big, too imposing. But the idea of the Gothic is that it should be enthralling, right? And the, the building should look as if it is leaping upward from earth to heavens, right? Uniting, connecting earth and heaven. And in a sense, lifting the soul up into the air, into the celestial spheres. The Gothic builders also experimented with central designs, right? They started to break away from just the simple uh, linear orientation from entranceway to chancel. And they became interested in adding in circular or octagonal elements that looked more inward towards the central focal point. And this is a famous example, the Temple Church in London, which was built for the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar, of course, they, their headquarters was at Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. They knew of the Dome of the Rock and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and these other domed buildings in Jerusalem. And they brought some of those ideas and plans back with them to Europe. Also, chapter houses became sort of laboratories for experimentation in central designs. And this is uh, the chapter house at York Minster. And the chapter house is actually the meeting hall where the monks or canons who were uh, attached to a particular cathedral would meet, right? They would live in a cloister right, that colonnaded square structure. But they would then, they started to build these chapter houses as meeting halls, and they would be oriented centrally towards the central focal point. So as you go from Romanesque to Gothic, there's this move towards greater and greater verticalism, richer embellishment and ornamentation, and more central, uh, or at least hybrid, central and linear plans. And then as for the ornamentation, a lot of that is inspired by Islamic designs that pilgrims would have seen, knights and warriors and builders would have seen when they went to the Holy Land uh, in the Middle East or to Spain. And a great example is these multi-foil arches. So we've seen blind arcades already, right, in Romanesque and Gothic building. But now they're trying out these sort of complex flower-like profiles. Uh, purely for decorative effect to engage the eye. And even these little intricate uh, tile decorations also are mimicking Islamic buildings. And then the embellishment with statuary, right? So now instead of simply having little figures carved into Romanesque capitals, now you have these full figures of saints and biblical figures, also sometimes kings, historical kings, patrons, uh, rulers, who patronized the buildings. And this whole new style is invented, first at Chartres, or at the royal portal that you see here in Chartres, and then it's spread all over Europe. These elongated, sort of surreal figures, who again are sort of stretched upward, like the form of the building itself, right? Reaching up towards the heavens, looking almost as if they're lifting off into the sky or into the heavens. And of course, they're very famous for stained glass. And this became a way to bring color uh, into these churches. So once you had these much bigger, taller, soaring window bays that were giving enough light to illuminate the building, you then could further embellish with stained glass. And the early style involved these figures. Uh, you know, these are biblical figures, Seth and Adam, uh, the coats of arms of probably patrons who contributed to the cathedral. And then later in the 1200s, 
these arrangements into complex forms like this rose window, which is the famous south transept rose window in Notre Dame de Paris. So that's some things you would have seen if you looked around you and looked up. There also was ornamentation if you looked down. This is, is an example of a Cosmati mosaic floor in Santa Maria in Trastevere in Rome. So it was made by a family of craftsmen in Rome called the Cosmati family. And then that was brought to England. So English uh, patrons brought in Cosmati artists to put in these sort of inlay mosaics like this one in Canterbury. This is the famous uh, so-called great pavement made by the Cosmatis in Westminster Abbey. And these four uh, rectangles housed tombs. And again, you can see the mimicry of Islamic and Middle Eastern motifs. So the Cosmati pavements became very popular in Italy and England, not so much in France. In France, the custom became uh, mosaic labyrinths. And this is a surviving example from Chartres. You can see people would have walked along the pathway going through the labyrinth until they reached the center. And it was a sort of meditative practice, it seems. And the popularity of the labyrinths in France underscores how the cathedrals ultimately were intended to be sort of all-encompassing, enveloping experiences. Just walking into one, looking around, seeing the sights, the light, the colors, the sounds, was almost like a meditative experience. So this is just an example of a French high Gothic cathedral. There were many that were built in the 11 and 1200s, and they tend to be fairly similar. They more or less all follow and draw upon uh, Saint-Denis and on each other. So a lot of the features are recognizable. If you've seen one, to some degree, you've seen them all. But just for an example, this is the front facade of Rheim, built in the early 1200s. You have these elaborate decorative arches, the little statuary that you would see as you were entering the rose window, the two towers with this delicate tracery, flying buttresses. This is looking up into the vault, right? These huge, soaring, uh, clear story windows going up into the groin vaults. And this is the plan of the cathedral. So you can see here, it is still linear, right? You would still walk into it like a basilica, proceed through the crossing and back into the chancel. But the transept you can see has been reduced down to almost nothing, right? There's hardly any separation here. Uh, and there are these huge radiating chapels all pointing inward. So more and more, the, the layout of the church is being reoriented towards the center. And more and more, the crossing is sort of the center where the worshiper can stand or sit and look around himself or herself and see this grand towering environment all around them. So this is just a view down the nave of Rheim with the huge west rose window. Again, uh, these windows have been pushed so high, there's tremendous bright light bathing the building. And then this is a view of the crossing. And you can see here, this is the chancel back up in here, right, with the ambulatory behind it. But the altar has been pushed all the way out, almost into the crossing, so that more and more, again, the focus is inward, right? It, it has more of the feel of like a temple or a chapel with a central focal point. And over here, again, another rose window. This is the transept, which is very shallow, right? It doesn't reach way off like in most older churches. And this is the pipe organ. So this would have been around the time when pipe organs were first being introduced into churches. So there was a very long tradition of choral music and chant, but now instrumental music was being introduced into the cathedrals and was more and more part of the experience. And this is a lovely sculpture that I love of men playing musical instruments in Santiago de Compostela. And this one here, this two-person instrument is an organistrum or hurdy-gurdy, where one person would have cranked uh, a wheel, which would then uh, play against the strings, and the other person would turn the pegs to change the notes. And uh, it's a real thing. It sounds like something out of George R. R. Martin, but it's real. You can see them. And it would have created this great resonant sound, sound almost like a giant cello, which would reverberate all throughout the church. So it was the, the cathedrals were 
sites of activity, of gathering, where you would have been enveloped in sounds, in smells, in colors. It was a whole sensory experience. And to go back to Rem, Rem also had a labyrinth. Uh, each labyrinth was its own different design, right? And this one was in Rem for several hundred years, but it was torn out in the 1700s because the bishop didn't like that kids were playing around on it and making noise. So they were trying to kind of crack down, right, on this sort of almost boisterous, noisy, active experience of the cathedral. But we have these drawings of what it looked like. And it's very special because it has these five figures. And in the center, this is the, the bishop who first proposed and sponsored the building of the cathedral. And then in the corners are these four figures holding mason's tools, like a square and a compass. And these are believed to depict the different master masons, the sort of head builders who were brought in over the years to oversee the building and extension of the cathedral. And this is indicative of how by this time in the 1200s, more and more people were seeing and taking note of and becoming really fascinated with builders and with their sort of incredible skills and the sort of secret, almost supernatural seeming knowledge that they brought with them that enabled them to build these extraordinary buildings. So you see in medieval manuscripts more and more depictions of builders at work. This is from the Book of St. Albans in England. You can see uh, this person is sculpting a little pillar capital. This person might be dressing small stones or blocks, which they're then uh, lifting up by this sort of pulley system and laying to, to build the wall. This is from the French so-called Morgan Bible. Uh, and this is an example of where you see masons depicted building the Tower of Babel, right? Which is sort of the, the first biblical myth of a great building, right? And so here, this is a, a quarryman dressing a stone. Uh, this guy is using his, his square, right, to, to square off the corners. And then it's being hauled up by ladder or by this pulley system with a dude in a wheel, right? And we know that they did use these. They would put someone in a wheel to hoist up the stones and build up your wall or your tower. And then these are some later depictions. Uh, these are two female masons depicted working at a building site in Boccaccio's Book of Famous Women. And we do know from documentary sources that women did sometimes work as stonemasons. It was considered an acceptable line of work for women, like uh, fresco painting or illuminated manuscripts, because it was seen as devotional. There was a sort of religious devotional aspect to doing this work of building a church or an abbey. Uh, and then this is a really wonderful illustration, too, because it shows us the system of scaffolding and ladders that was used to access and stabilize these buildings as they were being built up. And then lastly, this is a wonderful example from the World Chronicle of Munich, again, of builders supposedly building the Tower of Babel using this pulley system. And what's really wonderful about this one is it shows here at the base of the building the lodge. And we know from also from documents that when masons traveled to a big building site, they would gather in a sort of makeshift wood and thatch structure or shelter called the lodge. And that's where they would do the sort of fine sculpting and chiseling work, preparing the stone elements to be put onto the building. And the lodge also became a sort of semi-official institution with its own leaders, that would set rules for who was allowed to work as a mason, what were the required skills and training, and that would sort of manage the mason's affairs, almost like a, a sort of quasi-official guild. And as for the mason's own documents, the, the vast majority of masons were illiterate, uh, and we have no surviving writings from them. But one rare exception was a builder named Villard de Honnecourt, who worked in France in the 1220s and 30s, and his notebook survives. And it gives us a little window into the sort of world of a traveling stonemason who was going from site to site, building these magnificent buildings and learning, copying, mimicking as he went. So you can see here, this is his drawing of the Tower of Laon as a possible sort of inspiration. These are his drawings of possible decorative elements, like the proportions of a human face. Then there are scenes of just guys wrestling. Um, floor plans of chancels of churches that could be copied, mimicked, revised, embellished. 
And he also invented different sorts of uh, machines like uh, cranks, uh, cranes, clocks, uh, water pumps. He, it seems he was a sort of polymath, a kind of medieval Leonardo da Vinci. But it just happens that he's the one medieval mason for whom we still have his notebook surviving. It's this one window into this world of the masons. And these traveling masons basically brought, uh, again, they, they, they became kind of the apostles of the high Gothic style. And they brought it to new kinds of buildings, like civic buildings. This is the cloth hall, or sort of market and guild hall of the cloth merchants in Ypres, in Flanders. And they brought it to different parts of Europe, to different lands, right? Somewhat into Eastern Europe, not very much, not as much as the Romanesque. But there are a few examples, like the Cathedral of Riga in Latvia has this sort of Gothic style, uh, ribbed vaulting, peaked arches. But it's a very subtle, right, very pared back gothic also into the east into the holy land this is the knights hall of the croc de chevalier the uh, knights hospitaller's castle in syria and in some ways it was mimicked and borrowed into different forms and different media like in the north with the great stave churches of norway which you know are a distinctive style unto themselves but i would say show a lot of influence of the gothic right with the dramatic verticalism the high peaked gables the little elemental uh, ornamental dragon heads and but all sort of built on top of a basic uh, cross plan right so this is uh, possibly slightly earlier the borgund stave church and then this is the biggest one the head all stave church built maybe around 1200 it went into Spain. Again, not as much, you know, the main heartland of Gothic was, Fran was France, and it also was brought into England. In Spain, there are a few, like the Cathedral of Leon. You can see the plan, the outline of it looks more like Romanesque, right? With the big transept, the two square towers on either side of the entranceway, but it has these Gothic details. And inside the Cathedral of Leon, it's very striking and and unique because the the piers the columns the galleries are all very simplified uh, the space is more open and clear so that you can see directly to the windows and the windows are the real emphasis with these rich distinct colors and you can see they have this style where each window has its own dominant color so that you can really appreciate the richness the vibrancy of it and this shows the influence of a developing Gothic style in France and Spain that was called the Réunion style, where the buildings became st structurally simplified. Again, they pared away these things like transepts, side aisles, made it into just a simple box. And here, this is a great example, Saint-Chapelle, which I would argue personally is the great masterpiece of High Gothic in Paris, built by King Louis IX to house the crown of thorns which was a holy relic obtained through the crusades and no flying buttresses just these simple engaged buttresses there's a crypt lower level where you enter that uh, holds up a lot of the weight of the structure so that then when you go up into the main chapel it is light airy there are minimal stone elements and as much space as possible just for windows and the windows are in this rich vibrant deep color. Uh, you feel almost as if you're uh, stepping into uh, a jewel box full of gleaming colored gemstones. So this is looking west towards the entranceway and the rose window. This is what it looks like the other way. That's the little reliquary where the crown of thorns was housed. So that's the sort of grand focal point that the whole building was built for. And then surrounding it are these gleaming deep blue and red windows and these delicately painted stone piers painted in patterns of red, blue, and gold. And these sort of rich interacting colors unify the whole space. It's really, of all buildings I've ever seen, you must see Saint-Chapelle to believe it. But again, it's a masterpiece because of its its striking visual effect, its warmth, its intimacy, its vibrancy. It is not a big building, right? Compared to the great Gothic cathedrals, it's just a little narrow chapel. 
So the Réunion style arguably was a response to a sort of growing crisis in the Gothic, right? Where so many techniques had been tried out to make the buildings tall, soaring, dramatic, but they were reaching certain limits, right? So the Réunion style basically says we give up monumental building. We're turning inwards into something richer, uh, smaller, more intimate. Meanwhile, builders in other places like England and Germany were still reaching further and further upward, testing the ultimate limits of Gothic monumentalism. So this is Salisbury Cathedral in England, built in the mid-1200s, which you can see is a tall, impressive building. And then over the crossing is this just gigantic spire reaching up 404 feet still one of the tallest buildings in England today, and when it was completed, the tallest building in Europe. Then in Cologne, the tower is not as huge as at Salisbury, but the nave itself was started with the choir in 1248, building up to a height of 143 feet in one single soaring room. And you know, this raises the question, at some point, does it get too tall? Is it just too mind-boggling, too imposing, or is it structurally unsound? And eventually the builders did reach their limit. So at Beauvais in France, the bishop sponsored the, the beginning of another Gothic cathedral, more ambitious than any before. And the nave, they started building with the choir at back at the East End here. And the vault reached up 156 feet. So th even 13 feet higher than Cologne. And they had built basically the choir and chancel, this side of the transept, and then one bay of the nave, when in 1284, the vault collapsed. And this was not a catastrophic collapse. You know, most stone buildings can be repaired, and they were able eventually to uh, repair and keep building. But nonetheless, it sent a signal, right? There was a great chilling effect. It raised the question of whether maybe they had finally pushed too far, right? And you can imagine the invocations of the Tower of Babel, right? You finally reached too far up into the sky. So this is roughly what the cathedral might have looked like if it had been completed. But they stopped building uh, beyond the transept and, in fact, never uh, completed this nave. Uh, to this day, it's still only a partial building. So you can say with Beauvais, really, uh, things had reached a sort of crisis point, and people had to respond in different ways. And on the continent, in places like France and Spain, uh, people did continue to build Gothic buildings. But after about 1300, they were drastically pared back and simplified. And you can see a great example here at Girona Cathedral in Spain where initially they started off with the chancel and ambulatory over here in the high Gothic style. But then when they continued building later in the 1300s, they simply abandoned the side aisles, the side chapels, everything. And they built a nave in an extremely austere and pared back style. And it seems that this, uh, this sort of drastically simplified, austere version of Gothic was inspired by the mendicant houses of the Franciscan and Dominican friars who went around the cities in the 13, 1400s, building sort of uh, hostels and meeting houses in a very plain style, right? In keeping with their plain, austere lifestyle. And this, it seems, was the first response to the sort of crisis of the Gothic after 1300. And so naves like this, wide, open, plain, understated, these became common in the continent. The one place where the builders didn't accept this, but instead kept pushing further with the Gothic into greater complexity, greater embellishment, was in England. And so England becomes the birthplace then of the late Gothic, the sort of most extravagant, most ornate style. But before I get into the late Gothic, let me take a look. Um, yeah, naked acrobatics. Um, yeah. Her, yeah, the hurdy-gurdy. Uh, yeah, Haydn wrote for the hurdy-gurdy. Uh, yeah, also a peasant gypsy instrument in the Northern countries. Um, 
regarding Saint-Chapelle, really interesting work done in Basque country at Bayonne. Yeah. Yeah, Basque country is in uh, basically north central or northeastern Spain, would have been along that uh, pilgrimage route, right, where styles, motifs, ideas were carried from central Europe into Spain and back and forth. Okay. Right. About the late Gothic. So the late Gothic begins in England around really in the late 1200s and then really takes off in the 1300s. And in England, it's often just called the decorated Gothic. So this is an example here, the Lady Chapel of Westminster Abbey in London. And you can see a lot of the elements here, the peaked arches, the stained glass, the statuary are familiar from the High Gothic, but they're kind of, uh, they're packed in in a denser, busier, more dramatic way than we've seen before. And these new elements have been brought in, like these hanging pendants coming down off these fan vaults that are um, just not structurally necessary. So this is the, the difference then between the High Gothic, where you would take structurally necessary things like uh, piers, ribbing, flying buttresses, and you would sculpt them to make them look decorative. In the late Gothic, you add in decorative embellishments just for their own sake, even if they're not structurally necessary at all. And the, the goal is just to create something dazzling and thralling and rich. And arguably the big laboratory of the late Gothic, people were trying out different things, uh, you know, bringing in uh, tracery, uh, steeper peaked arches in the 1200s, but then uh, Ely Cathedral in Cambridgeshire is where the late Gothic sort of reached this tipping point. And it was because of a structural collapse. So originally there was a square, a huge square bell tower on top of the crossing here uh, at Ely, like you would see in Durham. But in 1321, it collapsed. And whereas when Beauvais collapsed, the response was stop building and sort of pull back and rethink. In Ely, the response was, let's build something new that is not as structurally huge and, and heavy, that is smaller, but that is even more rich and dazzling. And so what they did is they basically cut in the corners of the crossing to make it into an octagon. And then they built this octagonal lantern on top of it, which looks sort of interesting, ornate, not necessarily so huge. But the real effect is in the interior. So if you're in the crossing and you look up into this octagonal space towards the lantern, you see this. <laughs> so you have now these eight huge piers, each of which reaches the top of the vault and or reaches the vault and splits out into arches and into this sort of spray of ribs called tiercerons, most, most of which are not necessary structurally. They're just for completing this effect this effect of a sort of radiating, uh, almost pulsating uh, octagonal form that looks almost like a, a plant or a tree, something coming to life. And then inside it, this brightly illuminated eight-sided lantern, such that when you're looking straight up, it can look almost like you're looking right into the heavens or into right into the eye of the heavens. Right? So there's this increasing uh, richness and complexity and also this increasing attraction towards central plans that draw the viewer inwards into some sort of dramatic central focal point. So the crossing of Ely Cathedral is sort of the announcement of this new style and this new desire to experiment, to push, to embellish further and further for more and more dramatic effect. Other laboratories include other chapter houses at different cathedrals, which now uh, not only faced inward on a central plan, but really re-emphasized and anchored that central plan with a central pillar, which again could break out into these multiple ribs, which may or may not be structurally needed, but create this sort of dramatic effect of, of lifting upwards, of reaching and reaching outwards, embracing. And here, this is at the Chapter House in Westminster Abbey, and you can see they've really emphasized the tree-like effect, right? With these ribs coming out, reaching bosses, and then branching out. And, and even, they, they look like palm fronds, right? It looks almost like you're under the shelter of some massive spreading palm tree. 
also lady chapels. So the real, uh, most of the masterpieces of late Gothic are not big grand cathedrals, right? They're in more intimate spaces that could be built alongside and attached to the cathedrals. And a, a good, uh, a good opportunity for that would be adding on a lady chapel. So a king or a duke or, uh, or a rich guild might pay to add on a chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary onto an existing church, and they could decorate it in the latest style with this complex tracery, these decorated bosses. And you can see here in these vaults, now not only do you have these sort of spraying fan vaults, now you have what are called liernes, these extra ribs that run in just decorative geometric patterns, right? Connecting one rib to another and intersecting and supporting these little decorative bosses. No structural purpose, just for fun. Uh, and likewise, these little stalls where worshipers might sit, uh, decorated with these almost lace-like uh, latticed OG arches purely for decorative effect, not holding anything up. So the idea, again, is, is to appear dazzling, rich, uh, abundant, right? To almost to recreate the look of uh, a verdant forest or a garden, but all in stone, and to make the stone look somehow alive, right? Moving, motion, life. Uh, and eventually these techniques then were brought in to rebuilt or redecorated vaults of great cathedrals. So this is Exeter Cathedral, right? These dramatic fan vaults coming out of the pillars and then meeting at these uh, liernes with decorative bosses. And this is the York Minster, uh, which, you know, was originally a monastery. Now it's a cathedral. And here you have this sort of almost webbing, almost spider-like uh, spider web like webbing of ribs meeting at these uh, gold leaf covered bosses reflecting and uh, lighting up with the sunlight from these massive windows. And arguably, if you had to pick one place that's sort of the real, uh, the, the place where high uh, late gothic really goes over the top is wells cathedral in england and so i labeled it here gothic goes mad right so this is a view looking through uh the retro choir or the sort of uh enclosed space behind the choir to the lady chapel in wells and you have again these these pillars that then branch out almost like trees but there are so many of them they sort of speak to one another like trees in a forest, like you're looking in a forest or an orchard. And then this is the crossing of wells, just to see how sort of madcap late Gothic could become. Uh, they built a huge square tower on top of the crossing and to support it, instead of just having big, massive, heavy piers, like you would in any ordinary Gothic building, they put in these, uh, these sort of inverted arches, creating a sort of X shape. Uh, and these like circular oculi, just like for fun, you know, and it, it it has a stabilizing effect, but again, not really strictly structurally necessary, just creating something interesting, mysterious. And as for our ornament, a lot of it is like what we would have seen in Gothic, but more detailed, more sculptural, right? These blind arcades with these decorative peaked OG arches, an arch within an arch within an arch sort of cascading one on top of another. Uh, this is the Minstrel's Gallery in Exeter Cathedral. So again, these little decorative spires sculpted, uh, I believe in bronze, and then these angel figures with musical instruments, again, emphasizing that music would have been coming out, right? There's this association of angels and music, and the, the singers and performers would have been in this gallery. And this is an example of a ceiling boss in in Exeter. And there would have been all kinds of figures, saints, angels, kings. Uh, but this is a common figure that appears in a lot of Gothic, especially late Gothic, which is the so-called green man, which is just a male face with foliage issuing out of the mouth. And it might represent something about nature, about the Holy Spirit, you know, which is breath, the spirit is breath, or, or maybe the preaching of the gospel, right, the sort of life a uh, life-giving gospel coming out of the mouth. They're often seen around pulpits, places where uh, priests and bishops would have been preaching the gospel. And this multiplies and becomes common in all kinds of late Gothic buildings. 
They're famous, of course, for tracery. This is an example. This is the Jesse window in Dorchester Abbey in England, which uh, the central bar of the window is made to look like a tree branching out. And these are the different ancestors or uh, different uh, branches of the family tree of Christ, right? Tracing from King David to Christ. And again, uh, stone being sculpted and shaped to look like a living organism, like a tree growing and branching. And these motifs then are brought into what's sometimes been called the Sistine Chapel of glass, the biggest, most complex single stained glass complex, which is the Great East Window at York Minster. And you see how, again, it's like uh, like branches or vines forming this incredibly intricate lattice work. And just a couple of examples of uh, of late Gothic masterpieces. This is the Lady Chapel added on to Westminster Abbey, which we saw we saw some of the interior earlier. So this is Westminster Abbey, right? Looking Gothic, right? F finely finished, detailed, ornate. But even that then is overcome by the incredible richness and complexity of the Lady Chapel, which was added on in the late 1400s under Henry VII. And this is what these windows look like inside, right? A sense of life, motion, almost like a fan or a screen unfolding before you, opening out these finely detailed scenes and letting in the light into the building. There's, there's this sense of constant motion and lastly, what I would consider the greatest masterpiece of late Gothic is King's College Chapel, Cambridge, which again, it's drawing on the Réunion style, right? It's just a simple rectangle, no flying buttresses, just engaged buttresses. Um, it looks kind of blockish, right? The, the only thing that strikes you from the outside is that it's very long with these repeating window bays. Um, but it can look kind of awkward, right, from outside, but the effect is when you walk in. What do you see? This. <laughs> These enormous unfurling fan vaults, uh, 12 of them repeating one after another the whole length of the chapel. And they can look a great deal like, like smoke or incense rising up and spreading out. The, the fine detail on the stone can make the stone almost look lighter than air, like it's just lifting up into the air, into the skies. These are other views. So this is looking from the other direction. And you see here the pipe organ. So this would have been a place of music. This is where students at Cambridge would have gone to hear choral music, to hear organ music. Uh, it would have reflected the sound back. And I would say the undulations of these fan vaults along the length of the chapel have a sort of rhythm to them, almost like music. It's like music in stone. And here, again, you see that the theme of the music and the proclamation of the gospel through music, underscored by these angel figures with their trumpets standing atop the pipe organ. So I would say this is basically the culmination of late Gothic in England. And for the first hundred years or so, this was overwhelmingly an English style, which only crossed over to the continent very little. It took until the late 1400s for it to really start to spread abroad. One of the early places it spread, of course, was Scotland, the neighbor to the north. And the great masterpiece of Scottish late Gothic is Roslyn Chapel, built by the Sinclairs of Roslyn in the mid 1400s. And you can see it again, it's a small, intimate chapel right? It's not a grand, soaring, tall building. It's not monumental. It's a small, intimate building with this incredibly rich and overwhelming ornamentation. Again, uh, alive, moving, uh, mysterious, romantic. This is part of why Rosalind Chapel has been the center of sort of romantic conspiracy theories for many years, right? It seems to have this mystery to it. And if you look here at the this you know, finely sculpted pillar capital. Above it is this little decorative figure, which is uh, an angel playing a bagpipe. And again, underscoring the the music, the fact that these buildings were used for acoustics, right? They They sort of came alive with music. And there are several figures like this around the altar of Roslyn Chapel, play, of, of figures playing different instruments. And Certain scholars have theorized that these sort of weird decorative bosses with these cube shapes and these little geometric patterns, in fact, encode musical notes 
and that there is a musical piece, which they call the Roslyn Motet, which they think uh, was meant to be played on these instruments that you see represented in the sculptures. Not everyone is totally convinced, but it's an interesting idea. And again, it underscores how late Gothic was so deeply intertwined with the medium of music. And it made it to the continent. Uh, in the low countries, a lot of the wealthy patrons were now no longer the church, right? Again, in, in Scotland, the patron was the Sinclairs of Roslyn. In King's Chapel in Cambridge, it was a church building, but the main patron was the, was the crown, starting with King Henry VI. And on the continent, you see uh, aristocrats and monarchs. And this is a depiction of uh, from a Flemish book of uh, a king enthroned sort of kibitzing, watching a stonemason and a carpenter work on his building. Um, but also a lot of them were civic and commercial associations like guilds, uh, you know, weavers' guilds, merchants' guilds. This is the town hall of Bruges, embellished in this elaborate late Gothic style, uh, built, of course, by, by the city association of Bruges. And in Venice, uh, the Republic of Venice and the, the wealthy mercantile families of Venice eventually also adopted late Gothic. And the builders there intercombined it, hybridized it with Mediterranean styles like Byzantine and also Islamic. And of course, the great monument of Venetian Gothic is the Doge's Palace, which was built in gradual stages in the 13 and 1400s. And you can see it has this lower loggia, which is open with these broad open uh, arches where citizens could approach, enter, uh, bring business to the Venetian government. Then above it, uh, a covered gallery with this elaborate lattice work, sort of semi-private where government meetings might have taken place. And then the private rooms on the top, right? With this sort of sheer wall that is just lightened by this delicate pattern in the brickwork. So this is sort of the, the great prototype of the Venetian Gothic, right? With each successive uh, level instead of becoming lighter and more airy, like in a Romanesque building, becoming more closed, right, as you elevate from the public to the private. And this template then was used in mansions like the Cadoro, right, where you have this open water gate on the canal with these bright, broad arches, and then finer lattice work as you go up into the higher galleries. And then finally, this purely decorative, almost crenellation along the top, along the cornice. In France, the late Gothic was adapted into what was called the flamboyant style, which means flamboyant, showy, but also flaming, literally flaming. And so this is Rouen Cathedral. You can see with this rich, intricate decoration, these steep uh, vertical arches and, and spires, and this delicate latticework breaking through it. And then this is possibly, you know, the perfect encapsulation of the flamboyant style, a window in Saint-Severin in Paris, which was rebuilt after a fire in the mid 1400s. And you can see the sort of intricate tracery of the stonework in the window mimics the look of a fire and hence, hence the name flamboyant. It also made its way to some degree into Eastern Europe. You can see this is Copernicus's house in Poland, which was a fairly typical town tenement house in a Polish town, but it has these uh, little Gothic arches, Gothic tracery in the windows, and these sort of funny uh, stepped arches over the facade, uh, which is a distinctively Eastern European variation on the Gothic. And then another style called Zonder, special Gothic, uh, Zonder Gothic, was developed in the Holy Roman Empire. And this is a great example here, the Stanislav Hall in Prague Castle, where you have this delicate interweaving, you know, vine-like or almost flower-like tracery. Again, not structurally necessary. Might have added in a little strength or stabilization, but basically just for a mysterious moving, growing effect. And this was adapted then also in Germany. Uh, just to the north of Bohemia. So this is a great late Gothic church towards the end of the Gothic era in Germany, the Annenkirche in Annenberg. 
And you can see, again, this delicate tracery, these sort of floral patterns that seem to be springing, growing like vines out of the pillars. And this is a view of the nave uh, where that sort of, uh, that, that Zondergotic tracery sort of crowns this open, bright, airy, uh, kind of forest-like chamber. In Spain, you know, <laughs> they go for decorative effect, richness, like the late Gothic all over Europe, but they do so more with fine tile work and frescoes, right, in the, this more Mediterranean style, clearly influenced by, by the intricate tile work of Islamic buildings. And finally, the ultimate, you could say, culmination of the late Gothic is in Portugal, right? So it very late around 1500, it makes its way into Portugal under the patronage of the King Manuel. And hence, uh, the Portuguese late Gothic is called Manueline. And you can see, again, it goes for lightness, delicacy, intricacy, but the specific shapes sort of don't make sense with the geometry of European buildings. And it clearly borrows a great deal from Asian art and architecture. So by 1500, Portuguese explorers were making their way all the way into the Indian Ocean, to India, Southeast Asia. And so ideas and motifs started to make their way back and were intercombined with the late Gothic. So you get this sort of extremely rich, fantastical uh, Manueline style. And the last late Gothic building I'll talk about, this is the Batalha Monastery in central uh, Portugal, north of Lisbon. And this is the Jeronimus Monastery in Lisbon, right? So under the direct patronage and support of the crown. And you can see now, uh, you know, late Gothic being pushed to the ultimate extreme or at every level down to, you know, a tiny, tiny uh, intricate details, everything is sort of encrusted in ornament. And again, the shapes seem to sort of mimic actual building structures like these arches and again, these double bays in the windows, but they are clearly not structural. They're almost lace-like, right? It just being kind of draped and woven around the facade of the building, creating this sort of ethereal otherworldly effect. So that arguably is sort of the ultimate culmination, or, or you could say the final dead end even, of late Gothic before there then is a reaction. But before I get into that, let me see. Um, let's see comments, starred, pilgrimage routes, the architecture. Yeah, especially with Romanesque, you can see new ideas and motifs just following right along the pilgrimage route. It's like hey, these pilgrims in Toulouse saw this grand enthralling cathedral and then they get to Santiago and it looks dumpy and old fashioned. We, we need to keep up with the Joneses, right? So there was a kind of, uh, you could say almost arteries of ideas and styles traveling around Europe along the pilgrimage routes. The number of vaults. Yeah, yes. Um, the number of vaults was often symbolic. Uh, and it, it, very often it was 12. When possible, like in King's Chapel at Cambridge, it was 12. And, you know, it speaks to the, the 12 apostles, the 12 months of the year, the 12 signs of the zodiac. And often um, the, the stone carvers would embellish the buildings with uh, symbolic sculptures and images evoking those sets of 12, like the 12 disciples or the 12 zodiac signs, and give a sort of sense of unity to the complex building. England really takes things too far. A lot of people felt that way. That's part of why the Renaissance happened. We'll just, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, Wells Cathedral with the bizarre inverted arches, it can look very modern. It looks almost like a weird, like late Art Nouveau 20th century building, but it just shows you how the, these late Gothic builders would try anything. Uh, polyphonic recitals in Notre Dame, yeah, definitely acoustics very much were in mind, and that's part of why those stone vaults were so important. Um, compared to Bach and later recitals, um, yeah, I've never appreciated how far off the rails late Gothic went. The Renaissance style makes more sense. That is exactly what I'm going for. Um, that is exactly the effect I'm trying to get across. So think about what the journey we've just been through and all these images of these incredibly intricate embellished late gothic buildings 
like the Hieronymus Monastery we see here. You're almost getting sick of it, right? There, you can't handle, you can't process any more of it. And if you were a pilgrim, say, traveling along to different holy sites around Europe, you could get to a point where you're, you're almost tired, like your eyes are exhausted from all of this richness and detail. And so it's not surprising that eventually there was a reaction. And that's where the early Renaissance comes from, right? A return to simplicity, balance, openness, right? This is an example of the courtyard of an early Renaissance palazzo in Italy built uh, near Rome for the Pope. But it's very much in the early Renaissance style that was just coming out of Florence. And you can see it, it has the sort of dignity, balance, openness of Roman style, uh, half circle arches, very understated ornamentation, almost no ornamentation. The richness, the texture of it really just comes from the subtle grain of the natural stone surfaces, right? And you can see how a building like this is not designed to dazzle, right? Like a late Gothic, it's designed to feel serene, almost placid, to welcome the, the visitor in and provide a sort of quiet, meditative mood. Um, and this is the style that very quickly uh, emerged and took off in the 1400s, starting in Florence, because of its sense of greater dignity, harmony. Uh, it was seen as a more masculine style, right? Whereas the late Gothic is associated with lady chapels, right? In veneration of the Virgin Mary, it, it signals fertility, abundance, right? The early Renaissance style is dignified, placid, viewed as masculine, right? The, the style of virtue, right? Virtue, virtu, manliness. So this was a sort of revolutionary reaction, right? Against what was seen as the excess of the late Gothic. And it comes about, of course, in Florence, right? So Florence was a prosperous, growing commercial city, largely based on the wool trade in Italy in the 1300s. And the Renaissance came relatively late to architecture. The Renaissance had already been going on for several generations in Florence in other fields, especially literature, right? And the recovery of, of Latin rhetoric and style in, in the mode of the Roman writers, the revival of Cicero, uh, all of this had already been going on for some time in Florence, which could seem rather strange because Florence was a fairly typical medieval city, right? It would have been tight, jumbled, packed with very narrow, tall, mostly Romanesque and Gothic buildings. Right? This is a, a fresco painting depicting the city in the 1300s. You have this Romanesque baptistry here, which had been there since the 1000s, but then around it, this sort of crowding this is a Gothic church with this tall spire. There also would have been fortification towers belonging to the powerful plutocrat families. And this is uh, San Gimignano in a medieval town in Italy as it looks today, <clears throat> which can give you some sense of what Florence actually would have looked like in the 1300s before the city and the region became stabilized enough that these families didn't need these towers and the city government was able to suppress the sort of feuding and street warfare between the plutocratic families and then finally ordered them to tear their towers down. So you get a more sort of dignified, open, harmonious looking city like we think of today. There was late Gothic in Florence. It was not a great center of late Gothic like, uh, like you would see in England or Germany, but there was some. That was the style of the 1300s, right? Uh, highly verticalist, highly ornate, richly embellished. This is Or San Michele in, uh, in Florence, which was the, the church sponsored by the different professional guilds, like the, the Dyer's Guild, the Weaver's Guild. Uh, and you, this is how guilds and patrons showed off their wealth and their prestige, right? It was with these sort of lavishly embellished Gothic uh, monuments and, and uh, precious uh, objects and artworks. But by about 1400, the taste clearly was starting to shift and people wanted something different. And the first builder, if you can even call him that, who delivered something new and uh, refreshing was Filippo Brunelleschi, 
who actually was not a stonemason. He was not a master mason. He had not been trained in the art of stone building like the master builders who built the great cathedrals. He was a goldsmith. And in a lot of ways, he was he was the first Renaissance architect, not only in the sense of his style, but also in the sense that he was a Renaissance man. He uh, was a polymath. He was multi-talented. He was seen as a genius who came from outside the field, right? Who was uh, who had shown his brilliance in some other craft, in some other art form, and others would follow. You know. Uh, Donatello was a sculptor. Uh, Michelangelo was a painter. Uh, well, Brunelleschi was a goldsmith, and he uh, put forward a plan to redesign and rebuild the uh, Infants or Foundlings Hospital, or Ospedale de Innocenti, in Florence. And this is what uh, he built, starting in 1419. Simple balanced, open, harmonious, uh, almost no ornamentation. Even the little uh, relief sculptures you see here in the roundels were not there originally. They were put in later. But what you have is this wide, long, open arcade, which is actually where parents, or especially women who had given birth to children they couldn't keep, would approach the building and hand them over to the nuns to be taken care of and raised in the hospital, right? So it's a place of, of offering, of transferal, and it is designed specifically to look open, wide, welcoming, right? Facing the city with sort of simplicity, dignity, balance. It has all those classic qualities of a long horizontalist building, right? It's grand and impressive, but not imposing, not towering, not dazzling. And you can see people at the time actually thought of the connection between the wide open colonnade of this loggia and open arms, almost like the Virgin Mary herself uh, opening out and welcoming these children. So you can see this is a painting by Michelino from the 1440s depicting Madonna of the Innocents, right? The, the patroness of the hospital reaching out her arms, sheltering these children being brought to her like the arcade of the loggia reaching out. Uh, and later on then in the roundels, which used to be empty, these sculptures by Della Robbia were added in of infant children wrapped in swaddling clothes, but posed in these oddly sort of classical Roman poses, right? And again, with their arms outstretched as if greeting and welcoming uh, the poor mothers and their infant children being handed over. So this building was, was designed in this radically different style, not only reviving the forms and motifs of ancient Roman building, but adapting them to give this feeling of openness, of welcome, of harmony. And the next big task that he then took up, he won the contest to build a dome on top of the cathedral. So as I said, there was this Romanesque baptistry here that had been there for hundreds of years, and it's um, built right on top of the foundations of a Roman temple of Mars. And they decorated it in this Italian Romanesque style, right? Then in the 1300s, the city's growing wealthier. They want a bigger, more grand cathedral. They build this cathedral with a facade with these Gothic elements. So it's this sort of hybrid Romanesque Gothic uh, template. And then Giotto, the painter and builder, uh, designed this grand campanile, basically mimicking the, the facade. But the problem was the crossing of the cathedral. If we ignore this view of the dome that we see here, there was nothing there. And the problem was what to do with it. So this is the form, the ground plan of the cathedral. And you can see the crossing is this massive open octagon. And early on, it was thought, oh, well, we'll build a huge multi-tiered spire, like at saint Fernand de Toulouse. But in the late 1300s, it was decided, no, it should be a dome. That is what will complete the form of the cathedral. The problem was no one knew how to build such an enormous dome to cover this tremendous crossing. And the city held a contest, and Brunelleschi won the contest, even though he didn't really have a specific plan. And he had to scramble and figure out, how am I going to do this? 
the obvious answer was, well, mimic what the Romans did with the Pantheon, right? With that enormous, what then was the largest dome standing in Europe at the Pantheon. But what's the problem with trying to do that? There are multiple problems. One of them is that the Pantheon dome is a solid block of Roman concrete. And that's why it's able to, it, it was it was possible to build it all in one go and have it solidify and hold its shape. No one in the 1400s knew the recipe for Roman concrete. They couldn't make anything that strong. So they had to somehow build it out of masonry. Now, if they wanted to build it out of stone masonry, the problem then was they would have to build scaffolding up through the cathedral and then centering basically a sort of wood substructure so that the, the stone masonry could then be built around it. And they couldn't do that because that would require such massive scaffolding that it would require more timber than existed in all of Tuscany. So it was just too big. They didn't, they had no way to do it. So the only option left was brick. So the question was, how could you build an enormous octagonal based dome that would hold up and be stable out of brick? So that's what Brunelleschi had to figure out. And what he, after much experimentation and, you know, futzing around, he guessed that what he could do was first build an inner dome that would be uh, made of circular bands, one on top of another on top of another, so that each band as it went in would hold its shape, right? would be supported by the rest of the dome under it. Then the question was, well, if the dome gets too heavy, the forces pushing down at the center of the dome would then be translated down to the base, but they would push outward, just like at the, the vault of a cathedral, right? Which you have to hold in with flying buttresses. If you built this dome just out of brick, the bottom would push outward until it cracked and collapsed. So what he figured he could do was build the inner dome upward, but then as he went, run successive chains around the sides at four different levels. First, a massive stone and iron chain around the base, then a wood chain, then another stone and another stone. And that those would sort of hold it in like staves of a barrel and stabilize each level as they built upward. Once they completed the inner dome, then they would cover the chains over with an outer, a light thin brick outer dome with these stone ribs that would sort of uh, ornament and emphasize the gentle curves and the octagonal shape. So that's the method he figured out and it worked. And it's made out of more than 4 million bricks. And when it was completed, it was the largest stone dome. Or, sorry, I mean to say when it was completed, it was the largest dome in the world, even bigger than the Pantheon. And still to this day, it is the largest brick dome in the world. And it, you can say it not only completes, but really crowns uh, the, the Duomo, the cathedral, and the whole skyline of Florence. Now, it happens that... Uh, when it was completed, the drum around the base was still uncovered and undecorated. And later on, uh, Baccio Dagnolo was commissioned to design an ornamental frieze to go around it, to cover over those sort of bare stones and bricks around the drum. But Michelangelo saw it and disapproved, so he gave up and they stopped building it. So just this one section is there. The rest is still bare. And you can see the ends of the crossbars of that stone chain still sticking out, right? And people seem to not mind. They've left it that way. And this is how it looks, right? <laughs> An incredibly brilliant skyline, right? This complex, ornamented, uh, almost, you know, fanatically verticalist Gothic campanile, and then sort of counterbalancing it, and you could say speaking to it, this gently curving round dome. And the dome of the Duomo really sort of announced to the world that, uh, that Florence was the heart of this new rebirth, this rebirth of new art, new learning, the revival of the ancients and the classics, which they you know not only could use to write sort of clever, elegant Ciceronian speeches, but which they could even use to build uh, new soaring monuments in a way that no one in the world had seen before. And so still really to this day, the Dome, Brunelleschi's Dome of the Duomo is the great monument 
uh, of Florence, the symbol of Florence, and the symbol of the early Renaissance. So uh, I think since we've gone on a while, I think I will stop there. And next time we'll continue on with the career of Bunaleski, his other buildings, and how the Renaissance style uh, spread and took hold as it was taken up by new builders, new architects, and as, um, and as it spread beyond Florence, first to Rome and then to other countries and cities all around Europe. Uh, but thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm going to look at the comments. Uh, and then uh, I also want to give uh, acknowledgement and a shout out to thank you to a longtime listener, uh, Debbie Davison, who I've been told is in the hospital. So sending good wishes, good thoughts uh, to Debbie. Uh, but lastly, looking at the comments, uh, Foundling Hospital looks like a school. Yeah, well, uh, civic buildings tend to be on the Renaissance template and the Renaissance style. Um, that's So that's sort of imprinted in our minds now, right? That schools, city halls look uh, neoclassical, basically. But in the 1400s, this was something radically different, new, refreshing. Um, yeah, Brunelleschi guest, you know, and uh, he, he was very much on the line. And part of the story of what happened is that he was chosen to uh, execute this dome project, even though he didn't have a specific plan. And the city said, well, OK, uh, we choose Brunelleschi, but we're also going to have Brunelleschi's arch rival, Ghiberti, who was another metal worker uh, alongside him as co-director of the project. And naturally, Brunelleschi resented this. And so uh, he would keep going into the building site and overseeing uh, extensions and improvements. And Ghiberti would say, well, I know what to do and kind of interfere until Brunelleschi just called out sick for like a month and said, OK, Ghiberti, you go ahead, see what you can do. And Ghiberti basically had to give in and say, all right, Brunelleschi is the one who knows what to do here, even though he is improvising step by step. He's got the right ideas. He can finish it. And miraculously, he did. Uh, so again, thank you. Uh, thank you to Debbie. Thank you to all my listeners and especially to my patrons. Uh, and hopefully we'll pick up next time with uh, the the Renaissance and especially the high Renaissance and the great geniuses like uh, Michelangelo and Bramante. Thank you.